So my name is Howard Rodstein. I'm from Wavemetrics Incorporated, and I'm going to talk about HDF5 in Igor Pro. So what is Igor Pro? Igor Pro is a commercial scientific graphing and data analysis program with a built-in programming environment. It runs on uh, Macintosh and Windows, and it's similar to MATLAB or Origin. And Igor is used uh, in academia, government research labs, and high-tech companies all over the world. So Igor has supported import and export of HDF5 files since 2005. And the current version, Igor Pro 9, which we just started shipping about a month ago, adds a, uh, a, an Igor Pro format for saving entire Igor Pro workspaces to HDF5 files and restoring them from HDF5 files. So in this presentation, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, Igor's HDF5 browser, Igor's HDF5 programming uh, capability, and uh, Igor's HDF5 base workspace files. But before I start, I want to clarify some terminology. Um, in Igor, we use the term wave, which is short for waveform, and that is about the same as data set in HDF5. And we use the term uh, data folder, which is similar to group in HDF5. And we use the term experiment, uh, which means basically workspace or project. And an experiment file is a file containing all of the data for a given workspace. So there are two main types of uh, experiment files. One is the packed experiment file format, which goes back to 1989. And it's the original, uh, actually it was the second format, but it's the main format used. And the second is the HDF5 packed experiment file format with a .h5xp extension that we just uh, started shipping in 2021. So I'm going to show you Igor's HDF5 browser now. And um, we're going to switch to a, an instance of Igor. And to create an HDF5 browser, you go into the data menu here down to load ways and then new HDF5 browser. So here's our HDF5 browser and I'm going to click open file. And uh, we ship a few sample HDF5 files which are used with a guided tour. And this is one of them. I got it decades ago. I think it's a NASA file, but I, I don't really remember. So we click that. I'm going to expand this. Maybe you can see it better. And here we have a list of groups. Here we have attributes for the currently selected group. Here we have a list of data sets. And here we have a list of attributes for the currently selected data set. We can preview the selected uh, data set or group. So I'm going to click in this preview options section. I'm going to click show graph and show table. And now when I click a data set, I get a preview of the data set in the graph and a preview of the data set in the table. There's another preview that I found extremely useful during development, and that is uh, the dump. So this is an, an H5 dump dump or a DDL dump of the selected data set or attribute. So if I click on a, uh, a data set, I get in the HDF5 dump window, the output, output from an H, H5 dump command in DDL format. And uh, we can show the attributes in the dump. We can hide the attributes and show the data in the dump and so forth. Uh, during development, I found this invaluable when there was some ambiguity. I didn't quite understand what the documentation, the HDF5 documentation was saying. And I needed to, I needed a reality check or to get to clear up some misconceptions. The ability to quickly and easily see a dump I found very useful and I, I know our, our users have found it useful also. So I'm going to close the previews and now we're going to load a file. 
which we do by selecting the data set and clicking load data set. So now we've loaded the data into memory. It created a new graph and new table because we have those options selected as our preferred behavior. Now, Igor has a data hierarchy which is visible through a window called a data browser. I'm going to display the data browser now. This is showing the root of Igor's data hierarchy. And this is showing uh, the data set that was loaded when I clicked the load data set button. That happens to be a, an HDF5 image and it has a palette that goes along with it. So the palette was also loaded. Um, we can also, in a, as well as loading data sets, we can load an entire group, including recursively. So if I click the root group here and then click load group, we get a new data folder in Igor that contains all of the contents of that group. So that's a pretty quick and easy way to load an entire data set. So that's the gist of the HDF5 browser. And oh, there was one other thing I wanted to mention about that. Let me first clear the workspace to get rid of some clutter. Uh, the HDF5 browser is implemented in Igor code. So if I go down into the Windows menu and to Procedure Windows and select hdf5browser.ipf, IPF standing for Igor Procedure File, um, we see this procedure file which contains Igor procedures uh, that implement that, that browser that you just saw. Now, if you look at the procedures, it's, it's C-like. Uh, here's the structure. Here's a function. Here's a function returning a string. So, you know, it's, it's pretty um, something that C programmers would recognize. Here's a do loop and so forth. So that is how the HDF5 browser is implemented. Now let's go back to my slides and see what is next. Um, okay, Igor's HDF5 programming support. So uh, we're gonna take a look at uh, the operations and functions that Igor adds that provide uh, control or support for um, HDF5 features in Igor. I'm going to go into the help menu and choose help windows. Go down to this help window here, Igor HDF5 guide. And here it is. And uh, this describes everything HDF5 related in Igor. It includes an HDF5 guided tour, which uh, is intended for people with pretty much no knowledge of either HDF5 or Igor. I wanted to write a, a guided tour that even someone just considering using Igor could, would feel comfortable with. And certainly an Igor user who, who did not know HDF5, I wanted him to feel comfortable with that. Now, I'm gonna scroll down here and uh, uh, this part of the guided tour shows how to load data uh, through the HDF5 browser, which we've already seen. I'm going to scroll down to the part that shows how to load data programmatically. Um, here is the first function that uh, the, the tutorial uh, presents. So it's a function that takes a data set as a parameter and it loads the data set. This is the command that loads the data set, HDF5 open file. Actually, that doesn't load it, that opens the file. And the file name is hard coded in this example, and this hard codes the folder. In a later part of the guided tour, both of those things are made as parameters to the function so that it's not hard coded. But at this introductory stage, it's hard coded. Here we open the file. Here we load a particular data set whose name was specified as a parameter, and then we close the file. So you'll notice that this looks nothing like HDF5 library programming. And it's Igor-like, it's not HDF5-like. Um, and uh, so it's easy for Igor users and Igor programmers to get started with and to understand. Requires very little 
knowledge of HDF5 beyond the basic understanding of things like files, groups, and data sets and attributes. So now, okay, okay, there are three uh, experiment file formats. Just to refresh your memory, the term experiment means workspace in Igor. Uh, the first format was created in 1987. We call it unpacked. The second was created in 1989. We call it packed. And then the third was actually created in 2019, but first started shipping in 2021. We call it HDF5 packed. So the HDF5 packed experiment file just saves the entire Igor experiment or workspace in one file. So you can save it to a file, quit Igor, restart Igor, reload your environment from the file. I'm going to demonstrate that right now. So I'm going to start by uh, clearing the clearing the workspace. Uh, we don't need the HDF5 browser for what we're going to do now. And um, I'm going to open an example experiment. I'm going to file example experiments, sample graphs, Demo experiment number one. This experiment we've been shipping since 1989. It shows some Igor graphics capability. And we just loaded it from the example file shipped with Igor, which is a packed experiment file. It's the format that's been around since 1989. I'm going to save it as HDF5 packed. So I go into the file menu and I choose save experiment as and I choose HDF5 packed experiment file here, and then I click save and it doesn't, well, I already had one, so I have to replace it. And it says, uh, sorry, buddy, uh, in order to save as HDF5, you have to convert everything in the experiment to UTF-8. And I'll explain, we're gonna convert to UTF-8 and then I'll explain briefly why we do that. So, to convert to UTF-8, I go into the miscellaneous menu, text encoding, convert to UTF-8. I can see a summary of all the objects in the experiment that are not UTF-8. Here I have a list of waves that are not UTF-8. I can convert the waves to UTF-8. Here I have a list of strings that are not UTF-8. There are none in this experiment. List of text files such as uh, procedure files, convert to UTF-8. Now the summary tells us everything is UTF-8. And so we can now save the experiment as HDF-5. So I'm gonna do save experiment as, same as where we were before, saving as .h5xp. And this time we don't get the complaint about UTF-8. So why did we get that UTF-8 business? Well. In 1987, when we started on Igor, we were on Macintosh. Uh, we used Mac Roman. At the time, I didn't know we were using Mac Roman. I had no concept of text encodings whatsoever. Then in 1995, when we started to port to Windows, I had to start to, uh, oh, I understood that there is another other text encodings. Actually, I had understood it before because we have a lot of Japanese users and I'd, I'd had to grapple with, um, Japanese text encoding. Then we ported it to Windows, had to grapple with Windows text encoding, had to grapple with cross-platform issues, saving an experiment on one platform, loading it on another, a lot of really nasty issues. So when I started working on the HDF5 packed experiment file, I decided I'm not opening up that can of worms with H uh, of text encodings with HDF5. Everything is gonna have to be UTF-8. Well, that led me to find that's that's a good rule to make a rule. Everything has to be UTF-8, but how does a how does the average user make it UTF-8? Well, that led me to have to create this dialogue here, which we just saw. This was a lot of work. This took me probably I don't know a month or two to do, but it had to be done because other this is the only way that a the average user would have any chance of converting to UTF-8. Um, and, and having a reasonable chance of success. So now 
I'm not sure. I don't see the clock, so I can't tell how my time is going. Yeah, I think we are almost done with the time. Okay, is it yeah. zero? Yeah, uh, for 15 minutes time, yes, it is zero. Okay, then I have five minutes, right? Yeah, five minutes question. I'll take a couple minutes for one more right. one more thing here, and then we'll, if there are any questions. Um, we're going to look at that file that we just saved, the uh, HDF5 pack experiment. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, clear out the current workspace, go in and create an HDF5 browser, and I'm going to browse that HDF5 packed experiment file that we just created. So here's, this shows you the structure of the file. Here's the packed, the packed data shows you the waves that, are, that were displayed in the graphs. The recreation is, is eager procedures that recreate the graphs. So one nice thing about this, and the main reason why I created this format, one, well, the main reason was that I wanted an open format that anybody could easily open with no problem whatsoever, because I thought our, our customers would appreciate having that window to the rest of the world. Um, and the other reason is that anybody can look at this and very quickly understand the file format. Um, whereas I actually went to some pains to document the old packed format, which is a binary format. I don't even bother to document this because it's pretty much self-documenting. So with that, I will close my thoughts. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Howard, and especially for switching the um, so there is one question from Lucas. Lucas, do you want to ask the question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, so Howard, uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was interesting. Thank uh, you. I have a question on the pre-computed preview data set that you shown. Uh, mm -hmm. So is it a pre-computed? Uh, I mean, the preview data set, is it pre-computed or do you uh, generate the preview on the fly? We generate it on the fly. Okay. In that case, do you actually read all of the data set values or yes. you just uh, sample uh, the data? No, no, we read the whole thing. I mean, that, that particular data set is, I don't know what it is, uh, 512 by 1024 or something like that. For Igor, that's a, that's a small data set. Igor ah, is okay. very fast. Okay, yeah, I, I just saw it uh, opening quite quick and I, I thought it, it would be uh, maybe a pre-computed uh, data, but interesting. Okay, yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we, we are in the break now. Uh, so okay. we, um, next session starts at 1035 Central. But if there are any questions uh, for Howard or anybody else, uh, please continue using the break. Um, but, yeah, thank you. Hey, Howard. Uh, this is James. Thanks very much for stepping in for me there. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> I really appreciate that. Actually, I did have a question, though, yeah. and I was really interested in, <clears throat> in the, way that, um, the way that you designed your API. You said it's not like using your, it's not like the HDF5 API. It's a little bit different. And, um, and so how did you choose the particular calls you made? Well, like, how did you structure that API? You know, I, I don't remember 100% because I, I think I started this in 2004 or 2005, but sure. you know, I started by reading the HDF5 documentation and getting my head around it. And we had, we had file loaders for loading various kinds of files, Excel files and MATLAB files and text files yeah. and whatnot. So that was the model. And then pretty much um, for every kind of uh, HDF5 object type like data set, um, group or attribute, it was obvious we were going to need a corresponding operation. We yeah. do have to jam. Each of those operations has lots of flags. Yeah. So options, you know, yeah. when you're saving data, when you're saving a string, do you want to save it um, null terminated, uh, 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 null fill, space fill, variable length? You know, so there's a bazillion different options. But um, I guess I just started with uh, opening a file and closing a file, and then asked myself, "Well, what's next?" Because I okay. don't think I don't think far ahead. Well, I just pretty much take one step at a time. All right. Okay. Yeah. I guess I I just wondered because there's you know there's a HDF5 is used in a lot of products, 
And I think a lot of them put a layer on top of the API right. and then say, okay, we're going to use HDF5 as our base format, but we're going to, we're going to actually only expose a subset of its features. And that's true of Igor too. Um, there's no way we can expose, you know, we expose the most commonly used features, but uh -huh. there's no way we can expose everything. There are a ton of HDF5 features that we can't, support now i have when customers run up against the, these things i do try to accommodate them sure. for example in eor pro 9 we had a customer who wanted to uh, read and write hdf5 based net cdf files <laughs> in, 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 in order to do that um, he needed the hdf5 um, dimension scales api which i had not supported <laughs> So I, I, I added support for that API, and that is actually just one Igor command that supports the entire HDF5 Dimension Scales API. Well, that's interesting. But, but actually, it's true. It's... it's true. I mean, there are there definitely, there, there are going to be situations, although we they've been few and far between, but there are going to be situations where we just can't do what people need to need to do because we're only exposing a subset. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, there is one comment that uh, awesome application. I really liked your. Thank you very much. Thanks.